the NBA preseason is officially underway. And when I want to go to the Eastern Conference, specifically a team that is in a, in a season of perpetual hope, ambiguously vibed, shall we say, which is, you know, a, a sort of rarity for this time of year. They have a young stud dart. They have players that other teams are very interested in, and they have a very proud history having been NBA champions just a few years ago. I speak, of course, of the Toronto Raptors. Welcome to Chuck and Darts, a podcast of informed, rigorous, reckless, harmless, speculative, and fun predictions about the game we love. You can call me chuck this is episode number 178 episode 177 was a deep look into the oklahoma city thunder with Derek parker everyone's favorite bandwagony team that's about to make the leap we dove into that perception and into you know their various young players not only shea gilgis alexander but the integration of chet holmgren uh, the ongoing growth of josh giddy and jalen williams and how a rotation full of so many intriguing young talents is going to shake out and how they stack up in the West. Uh, today, a first time guest, but a buddy that I've been meaning to have on for quite some time. Uh, he is with SDPN. He has worked for Raptors Republic. He was credentialed this summer at Summer League. Uh, he is a co-host of the Objective Basketball Podcast with another former guest of the show, Lauren Gunn, uh, Esfandiar Baraheni. Welcome, sir. How are you? I w thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm happy to be on first time here, but hopefully first of many, good sir. Um, it's funny you were talking about OKC with Derek Parker. First of all, would really love to read his book. Apparently, it's awesome. Would love to read it at some point in time. If you're listening to this, shout out to you, Derek. Um, also, just very excited to watch the Oklahoma City Thunder, which is yeah, very excited and also sort of jealous to be able to just like you know, be an Oklahoma City fan. I was actually searching it up today because of uh, Andrew Schleck's video, but I didn't know what a Sooner was. Uh, and I just found out today what a Sooner is, which is, sorry, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but no, it's that's just okay. something else that popped up. No, that's awesome. No, okay. So first of all, oh, it it's nice that OKC is considered cool in our little nerdy NBA right. uh, corner. Because OKC nationally, just as a city, doesn't really get the shine that maybe it could. Sure. Um, you know, as someone who lives in Texas, you get some very, you know, negative feelings about the state of Oklahoma in these parts. But, you know, that's <laughs> a bunch of silliness. Right. The fact is, um, I, I think that where the Thunder are is sort of like the sweet spot for being a fan where, you know, I was talking to Derek before we started that episode and he was saying how, you know, he started his draft work back when OKC was like really, really draft relevant a couple of years ago when their rebuild was still like a true, true rebuild and expectations were still very low. And I think the life cycle of fandom is it, it almost crests when you feel like you're ready to make that leap. Like you've invested yourself in a couple of draft cycles. You feel like you have a big personal investment in a few darts on a given team. And like everything is just about ready to pop. You know, so few teams make good on their stated ambition of like growing a core to win a title. Cause so few teams win a title mm -hmm. that it's almost like right now is sort of really where everyone is on the same page in terms of supporting that organization. Very few naysayers, you know, and yeah. the Raptors are sort of like, the Raptors are almost like a funhouse mirror image of that. Not, <laughs> not the total opposite, but just sort of a distortion because right. their expectations have been all over the place. You know, so it happens when, you swing for the fence and clear it with a Kawhi went Leonard trade and a NBA title. That's right. sort of, you know, all the traditional discussion about timelines sort of go out the window when you have that much success in such a condensed, you know, tenure of a player with a franchise. And so Kawhi leaves y'all, you know, it's COVID. Everything is absolutely insane, but, uh, a very sort of proud, uh, noble title defense, you know, memorable seven game bubble series against the Celtics. 
And after that, you know, the team is displaced for the next year. And then last year was sort of the first proper year since the title year, I believe, where, you know, stadium was full, team was at home, unless I'm mistaken, say, were there two? So it would be the year before that, too. Okay. They kind of, I know, it, it, honestly, all the years kind of jumbled together for me, too. But yeah, it would be, it would be two years of this. They're kind of back at it, full blown, crowds back, everything like that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And so uh, last year, was, was last year the first year without Lowry? Was that right? Or was he yes. as even? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So now that's sort well, of actually that... actually two years ago sorry see now that <laughs> now i'm now now you've got me worrying about the years that i've got okay yes it is it's been two years since lowry is gone yeah okay <laughs> rather than me trip over the recent history of this franchise again i'll just kick it to you as what <laughs> in terms of where this franchise is now yeah. um what are sort of the expectations internally you know new coach mm -hmm. nick nurse is gone Pascal Siakam's still there. OG still there. Scotty Barnes, we're going to talk a lot about, still there. Jakob Pertl back. Yep. You know, I remember back I hearing a report, I don't know if it was valid, back at the around the deadline last year saying, you know, Masai, the management still really believes in the team, but maybe like the players themselves might have felt differently. Right. Uh, has that flipped? What is sort of the temperature of the organizational expectations? I think that was that comment specifically was more about that specific season and whether they actually had hopes of being a playoff team, play in team, whatever you might think they could have been. But ultimately, it felt like they were just going at it the wrong way, whether that's just offensive approach, whether that's just the ideology, whether that's maybe the the message wasn't as receptive by the players from Nick Nurse. And obviously we saw that being the case. They now have a new head coach. Um, I ultimately think this season and maybe a little bit of last season is a bit of a transition period. Um, I think the Scotty Barnes equation, which we'll get to, sort of threw a wrench in what the expectations for this team could be going forward. And ultimately, I think there's a lot of, underlying i would say maybe clashing leadership styles between some of the younger players on the team and some of the older guys on the team that mm -hmm. you might have not expected to happen um and so a lot of things sort of snowball together whether that is some missed opportunities from the front office you talk about you know you obviously know this but the raptors have been so good at finding guys around the margins fringe guys that kind of worked and kind of became for rotation guys for them almost immediately over the last four or five seasons the guys that they've tried to do that with just haven't panned out you think of a guy like aaron baines who they signed uh to replace sort of mark gasol and sergi baka and that didn't pan out at all they thought he'd be this sort of stretch five for them that can play alongside pascal siakam that didn't work at all um, and then you think of draft picks like Malachi Flynn and they thought Delano Banton would be something in the second round. And some of these things just haven't worked out their way. There have been more misses than makes um, over the last five seasons from the front office. You add that, you add the Scotty Barnes kind of wrench in what I would say is, is a, an ideology, maybe a pathway that they thought or envisioned they had. Um, and it sort of creates a one foot out the door, one foot in the door situation with Toronto. Uh, and I think a lot of the fan base, if you ask them, they, they sort of want whatever it is to commit to one side, whether we are going in a new direction with Scotty Barnes and the younger pieces on the team, or, you know, you're committing full way. And I think back to a couple of weeks ago when the Damian Lillard trades were, were kind of rampant, a lot of people wanted them to go that way because it was just, pick a decision, make, make a decision, choose a path. Um, and I think that's where either, either where the fan base is, but also in general where the team is as well. And you think that's sort of, that is what is responsible for sort of an, a general sort of angst within yeah. the fan base and maybe among the organization. This is my, an outsider's perception of what's going on, but I saw the clip from media day where uh, our mutual friend, Samson Folk asked, yeah, uh, Masai Ujiri, you know, he pointed out, you know, for someone of Pascal Siakam's stature, who's been all NBA twice, 
you know, typically the a, a coach will sort of form an offense around his talents and not the other way. Know, yeah, right. And the, the all, all of the verbiage had been about the other way around that he's supposed to fit into what this first time, you know, NBA head coach Darko, is it Ryakovich? Is that how you say his name? That's it. Yep. Darko yeah, Ryakovich. The, yeah. Like that it's all about now his system and Pascal has to fit within that. And Samson pointed out that that's just not normally how, how teams do it. And Masai, like, I, I mean, he responded in general executive speak, but you could tell he was like, yeah, <laughs> I know what you're saying, Samson, but we're just going to just look the other way. Like, look, yeah. look at the kitty. Yeah. So, you know, it, it I think that choosing a path for them, look, at some point, if you don't choose a path, a path gets chosen for you. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. So with Pascal and OG, that's what that means because they are, they are much closer, obviously, to being able to leave than um, Scotty is. So right. I guess we'll just get to sort of that juicy roster question first and get it out of the way. What do you expect to happen? with those two men come next year next summer yeah you, you it's it's that's always a tough question with the raptors because what you expect is almost never gonna happen um the conventional pathway is just not what they usually do conventional the the conventional wisdom would say that you would trade fred van vliet at the trade deadline last summer or la last deadline the conventional wisdom would be trading Kyle Lowry at the trade deadline instead of doing a sign and trade for Precious Achua and Goran Dragic. The conventional wisdom is when you're 10 games below 500 to not go out and trade a first round pick for Jakob Pertl. But they have not been a very conventional team. So it, it's hard for me to sit here and say with certainty, this is what the Raptors are going to do with Pascal Siakam, because even if I say it, they most likely will end up doing the opposite. So maybe we should, I should say something and they will end up doing the opposite side of this. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I, I mean, look, I think the conventional wisdom again would probably be that they are going to most likely trade him. Um, mm -hmm. I would imagine just when that is, is maybe they're trying to find a way to leverage this game out, whether it's, 20 games into the season and there are a couple of desperate teams that maybe haven't got off to hot starts, but have expectations of performing better that now are in a position to maybe say, Hey, we will pay more for a guy like Pascal Siakam. Maybe that's at the trade deadline where, um, admittedly not the best deals ever get done, but you know, maybe there's a deal out there for him at the trade deadline. And then worst case scenario, you're looking at a potential off season where, He's not happy because he's been in trade rumors all summer or all season. And now he's looking to get traded. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to guess, if I really had to guess, I think there's most likely a, a scenario where they just walk into the off season and say, Hey, either we're going to sign you or we're going to figure out a way to sign and trade this thing. Because I think they've grown a little bit too sentimental when it comes to Pascal and like every front office gets this way, right? They value yeah, yeah. their players highly, but um, it's just the way it is. I, I think they've gotten to the point where they, you, they're not going to get equal value back for a guy who's a two time all NBA player. And I don't know how they kind of maneuver through that. Well, and when is his, what is the status of his contract next year? Is there any option on it or is he just, he's this no, year he's and just, then one more and then it's it. No, so it's this year, and then he's unrestricted. Um, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so this OG, is the last year. Yeah, OG is the one who has the player option, but he's definitely going to opt out of right. that. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, and then I think if he gets all NBA this year, he's eligible for a Supermax, although unlikely that any team really offers him that Supermax. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So Pascal... He is, you know, the word with him is that he is unwilling to sign an extension with like basically any team that he's been linked to. Yeah. Uh, Although I think, I think part of that is the whole Supermax thing. It's like, hey, I can get the most money here in Toronto if I stay here and am mm -hmm. an all NBA player versus if I go to Atlanta and, you know, they, they can't offer me that money anymore. So I think that's part of it. It's like it, it would, it just makes sense for him to not want to sign an extension with any other team when there's the option out there for him to potentially get more money. Okay. Well, 
we could play the the trade game all day. I could ask yeah. you what you know what players would you really be interested in and in coming right, right. back. You know, with yeah. Atlanta, AJ Griffin might be a fun fit since the team is so shooting star. But let's focus on the team as is, and let's focus on um, Scotty Barnes because okay. one of the other uh, reasons I was looking forward to having you on because is I want to talk about uh, most improved player which is an award that doesn't get a ton of preseason love. Uh, I think because most people view it as like pretty unpredictable, you know, who could have seen coming that right. Laurie Markinen would be the most improved player last year. That of course uh, is a nice challenge for me. That's what makes it fun is questions that people can't really seem to figure out. Mm -hmm. And with that award, what tends to happen is that a player who is not in their second year, there's a weird bias against second year players that I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with, but there is. Okay. One. Right. Well, um, I remember we, I remember we had this conversation. Yeah. I remember yeah. I just, yeah. I don't, they're like second year players should get better. And it's like, well, and third year players shouldn't like six year players shouldn't be getting better. I'm like what the hell? Come on guys. And yeah, it's yeah. just like, it's just speaks to the sort of, uh, mild arrogance of mm -hmm. nba you know media members and evaluators where it's just like well we could we can all assume that you know right second right, year players right. are going to get a lot better the same way lots of organizations just assume that their draft picks are always going to work out and they got their board exactly right you know right. it's just the same sort of like i just think you guys are missing the point a little bit right. but Regardless, the bias exists. And so in a world where we acknowledge that reality, usually what happens, it, at least in recent history, is that the player that wins that award uh, either makes the All-Star game for the first time in the yep. season in which they win. I believe of the last seven winners, the only player not to have done that is actually Pascal Siakam himself. And that was in 2018, 2019, where the Raptors are one of the best teams in the league. He's clearly contributing to all this winning. And then Pascal goes on to make two all-star games himself. So if we're trying to figure out who's going to win, it's either a, a present or, you know, a, a future all-star. Right. And in order to become an all-star in the NBA, you need a lot of usage. You need more or less, you need the ball in your hands, a, a, a decent amount. And so... Scotty Barnes, though he's had an accolade as as rookie of the year, uh, he's going to get a lot more usage this year. He's going to get what I would assume to be all that he can handle. Right. And this team is sort of an, an odd fit for handing over the reins. You, meant, you mentioned the clash and leadership styles, you know, between young and old. Pascal's still a world champion. He's still what... I would think just about everyone considers the very best player on that team. Yeah. So, and he also is not a natural pick and roll partner with Scotty because they're so similarly sized that lots of teams would just switch it. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't, you know, necessarily create the advantage for Scotty as the initiating forward that you would hope on paper between your two best players, let's say. So, yeah. How do you see their partnership working out as more usage sort of goes to Scotty? That is an excellent question uh, that I also, I think we have to sort of wait and see, unfortunately, because of Darko Rayakovich's style that he's hoping to implement into this. It's been sort of, it's been mentioned ad nauseum over the last week or so that they want to implement a 0.5 style offense. They want to kind of move the ball a lot more. The Raptors were top five, top 10 in isolation frequency over the last two or three seasons. Pascal Siakam was one of the most effective isolation players in the league last year. Um, but the Raptors were also bottom five in half court offense. They were also still bottom five in isolation efficiency, despite Pascal being one of the best isolation scorers in the league. So they want to get away from that a lot. And what you've been hearing has been five out offense, delay actions, a lot of dribble handoffs, a lot of, you know, situations where you can get the ball moving a little bit quicker. 
they want to initiate with Jakob Pertl a lot mm-hmm. more, which is why I mentioned delay, the, the, the delay actions. Um, and I think they want to get away from pick and roll. Are they still going to run what is the most conventional offensive system in the NBA in a pick and roll? Absolutely. They're still going to do it. Um, but I think they go away from that a little bit because there isn't, like you said, there isn't really an ideal pathway for them to be successfully generating pick and roll points. Like it's just the truth of the matter that, that if, even if Scotty Barnes is the ball handler in that situation, teams, like you said, with Pascal Siakam are going to either switch it or go under. And none of those guys are shooters in any sort of reliable way that makes you not want to go under or even chase, right? It just doesn't make sense for any defense to be able to do that. So now you're looking at dribble handoff scenarios where either Scotty is the guy handing it off and it's Gary Trent Jr. or OG Ananobi as the guy who's receiving the dribble handoff. This way, you know, attract the defense with some shooting. You have that open space. Maybe it creates a straight line drive for one of these guys to open things up for them that way. That's what I'm sort of envisioning in my head in terms of what might work. Now, how that actually is (laughs) implemented on the court when things don't necessarily go the perfect way Mm -hmm. is a big question. Um, And how that works between Pascal and Scotty in the past, they've worked incredibly well together when they had a Kyle Lowry initiating in the half court. uh, Sorry, actually Kyle wasn't even here for when Scotty was there, but when they had Fred, initiating mm-hmm. in the half court when they had guys who were reliable pull up threat pull up threats it made a lot more sense for those guys to i guess operate in similar spots of the floor um but now when things are a little bit more congested especially since they've added Jakob Pertl who is also a non-shooter who's another guy in the front court who is going to be kind of operating in similar areas of the floor it makes it a lot harder for me to see a world where he is that partner in a pick and roll um, and you know, even from the practice stuff that we've seen, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think they, they probably run a lot of small guards as their screeners so they can have that ghost action or they slip. And then that way you can maybe create some attention that way and go downhill. But yeah, that's, that's sort of the spiel I have on how that might work, how it actually is implemented. We got to see for it. No, it's, it's a good spiel. I was yeah. locked in the whole time. Spiel but... it up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, on, on a broad level, it's good that it doesn't look like they're trying to force that issue in practice cuz yeah. You know, rule number 1 for any NBA offense really is that you want to identify who your number one offensive priority is mm-hmm. and then do whatever you can to leverage the strengths of that player. I mean, that's, if you're not doing that, then like, what are you doing? And the Raptors are in a unique position where even if they want Scotty to step up his initiating duties, you know, Pascal is probably still a better offensive player than Scotty is at present, more of a threat at multiple levels uh, can collapse the defense in, in more different ways And so whatever tension there is, I can understand where it comes from. Mm -hmm. But for what, if if they really are going to commit to this, and if they're saying, you know, not necessarily it's Scotty's team, but we are going to orchestrate an offense that takes advantage of Scotty's passing, takes advantage of his size, takes advantage of his preference to sort of be physical 18 feet and in, um, then that naturally means that they have to figure out the geometry between him and Jakob, which you mentioned with, you know, a bunch of delay actions at the top of the key. I still don't, I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. Yeah. And, or um, Pascal's just going to be spending a lot of time off the ball, maybe as a cutter. I mean, Scotty's such a good passer. I'm sure that you can free maybe off ball screens with guards trying to free Jakob again or ghosting to try to make the defense freeze for a second to open up a lane. Um, All of that sounds like fun stuff to think about fun actions to envision. Exactly. But but when it comes to, is your offense going to be better than the offense that you're playing, even with how, you know, the, the Raptors have traditionally committed so much to defense. I just, the the math seems like it's kind of hard. It really does. So I guess if you're looking for a particular area of growth from Scotty as the team 
tries to figure out how to work an offense with him as the initiator, what is the main area of growth you would like to see? Ooh, um, I mean, shooting would obviously change things That'd be in great. a dramatic yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, but I'm assuming you mean a realistic uh, sort of area. That'd be nice, ass. If, we, <laughs> if you don't want to, we can talk about unrealistic things. No, but, I know, yeah. I know. I mean, look, I, I think this the shooting, like, it, that's obviously the thing, but that's sort of unrealistic in terms of what our expectations are for what he is this season. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of what he can really improve on, I think it has to be, and this is more of a schematic thing, but instead of putting him on ball, he is an excellent roller. He is incredible as a short roll decision maker, putting him in the middle of the floor, making him run the delay actions, actually. Yep. Some of these type of scenarios, he absolutely thrives in. And Darko, to, to be fair, has mentioned that that's going to be something that they utilize a little bit more, too. I'm less high on the on-ball stuff. That is more so, let's experiment. This is a playground. We have no expectations for this team. Let's just go out there and see what happens. But the... Sorry. <laughs> okay. The, <laughs> the, 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 the screener, the roller stuff, I got Let's bring in Darko. I, I assume yeah. that's who's giving you a call. <laughs> exactly. Let him speak for exactly. himself. Yeah. 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 No, my, my mother doesn't know any Serbian. She's just calling. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's stuff, it, stuff that involves him as a screener, as a guy who's a roller, uh, who can make passes in the short roll. I think that's, that's sort of where I need him to thrive this season. I think that's where he'll be at his best when it's these three on two situations. He can make a pass, he can make a decision. And also from there, he can kind of go one on one and operate in that space as well in the middle of the floor. In his rookie season, he thrived in that department. Like mm-hmm. being able to, his mid range uh, jumper was a lot more potent in his rookie year compared to his second year. There was a conditioning factor to that. He even mentioned that in Media Day, where it's like he gassed out essentially in year two. And he didn't he wasn't prepared for that maybe you see an uptick again in mid-range scoring and if that's the case things open up for him a lot more you don't necessarily need to be an elite three-point shooter just to get some things going for you for yourself offensively if you can keep defenses honest from a mid-range area like 18 feet out 16 feet out whatever it is right um i think it could work to his advantage a little bit more and now you're seeing that, that's that's sort of the evolution that Pascal went through, where it's like, okay, I can't be a consistent 34, 35, 37% shooter from three, but I can be a 40% shooter from the free throw line area, you know, free throw line extended. If I can capitalize on that when guys are going under, then that's an option for me every single time. And we've seen that over the last couple of years with Pascal. Maybe mm-hmm. that's something we see with Scotty. Yeah, and... I think it's a good point to sort of reset who Scotty is because, you know, he mentions that he might have gassed out last year and and that's, you know, self-awareness, especially self-accountability for something like that is something I always will appreciate in a player. But like Scotty Barnes, I think in in hindsight, people sort of see that rookie of the year award as you know, maybe we, the wrong guy wanted or whatever. And I'm not interested in relitigating it, but I, what I wrote about Scotty in a piece I released recently about all these, every basically young player in the NBA, I rank Scotty pretty high. I think I ranked him 15th or thereabouts out of every player entering year three or younger. Nice. And, okay. uh, you know, he was whatever he was 15, to 16 points a game, you know, seven rebounds, three and a half assists, a stock machine, you know, for yeah. a playoff team as a rookie. That that profile and I, whatever noise is in the numbers is the noise. That profile wins rookie of the year, you know, 99 out of 100 times. And you just, right. it's a phenomenal season. And mm-hmm. Scotty is still 6'9". He still has a 7'2", seven, 7'3", seven, wingspan. There is, I would argue no one with those dimensions in the NBA with passing vision as good as Scotty has. Right. And he plays physically. He knows how to use his body when he gets inside. And when you have that package, you know, it's going to look weird. Like it will, you know, it's, 
it'll look bizarre, but that is okay. You know, NBA stars frequently seem bizarre. That's sort of what makes them special. Yeah. And so I agree that they need to be creative in how they go about giving Scotty his sort of hub possessions. I think in particular, though, I think Jakob, I think he's a very good player. And I think that he is a very good screener for Scotty, because I think I would like to see Scotty matched up against centers and get the center sort of on their back foot, Scotty going downhill right. whenever they can. Um, there's just, there's going to be some, just element of the floor being a little bit clogged if if Jakob is never going to threaten to be a shooter and he never will it's never been his game um but hopefully they can scheme it out enough where either with Jakob on the court or maybe with you know Chris Boucher on the court in certain minutes to try to juice up a little bit of spacing you get to see you know Scotty with a very long leash inside the arc as a as a post up hub, right? Because I, that's the part of his game I really want to see is how how he just sort of develops as a post scorer. You know, as a as a rookie, he got so much just by um, just kind of playing bully ball, just very yeah. bruising. Not a lot of uh, like craft in his footwork. Lots of second chance points just having so much length to to get to sort of touch buckets over guys shorter than him, which is a great thing to have in your toolbox. But as he sort of graduates from just being able to outwork everyone and now needing to sort of develop a high degree of, of craft and skill in that area of the floor, that's what I want to see. Uh, has there been any talk either from Scotty or from anyone else in the team about him sort of expanding his like his post game, his post up game as a scorer. Not specifically, um, but I think some of the conditioning discussion is part of that. Um, and I wonder just I, I, this is maybe just speculation, but like I wonder how much of that is necessarily the post work and just being able to take the physicality of that. Um, again, I'm I'm not sure, but ultimately I think like. If you have, and by the way, great point on the points, like the post scoring, because he is so great at squaring his shoulders just all the time. For some reason, he's able to angle his body regardless of the contact and square his shoulders and go over the top. It's such an incredible knack that like he has such an incredible knack for that. I wish he used that more in a second season um, because it felt like he was maybe trying to expand his game a little bit more offensively, whereas if he maybe leaned into that, it could he could have mm-hmm. thrived a little bit more. Uh, and then that brings up the whole, hey, is it is he going to be a post playmaking hub when when teams start to send doubles at him? Now he can kind of create for the open guy, et cetera, exactly, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Um, that that's very interesting. There was a, a game every every time someone talks about his bully ball. There was a game against the Pacers in his rookie year, and this was when Sabonis was still uh, on the Pacers. He was just getting him under the rim every single time. It's like Sabonis is not a weak person by any means. He's a very strong individual. Um, And very proud of his strength. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So like the fact that he was able to do that, it goes to show you to your point that it's something he's effective at. How you manufacture space for him to be able to operate in that is the key question here. And that sort of goes back to roster building and how you're maximizing the space for a guy like Scotty to operate in that bully ball type of situation. Um, that I mean, that goes back to shooting and creation off the off the top and guys who can attack closeouts, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I don't know if I necessarily answered it, but I would love more bully ball, Scotty. Yeah, and I, 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 you did answer it, and I also think that if the question is how do you get him the touches in the post that he can leverage. I do think that is a bit of an easier task than, than solving sort of a a Scotty Pascal pick and roll or whatever, like stuff where shooting really comes to just hurt you. Cause you know, if you just make sure that number one teams are almost coached now, not to concede post possessions, but like the prevailing thought in the NBA now is that a post up, um is frequently like not a disastrous outcome for a defense if if 
with very few exceptions, right. if anyone is posting up, then that's okay. That means the back is to the basket. It means the shot is likely contested. It means like it's coming in between seven and 12 feet. You know, the math says that's fine. And frequently the math is right. But if dominance is dominance, if you develop dominance as an offensive player in any area of the floor, you're helping your team. And yeah. that is what intrigues me about Scotty. And it also, from an aesthetic perspective, makes the game better. Like, I would like to see players. I love it when players leverage spaces that defenses think they're being so smart by conceding. It's why mm -hmm. a couple of years ago when, you know, DeMar DeRozan was second team all NBA because he just dominated in clutch time so much. Right. It's one of the reasons that season was so fun to me because the idea was, well, he's in the mid range. Nothing could possibly hurt us if someone's <laughs> operating in the mid range. And then you get someone who dominates in it at the end of games and you go, man, it's kind of nice to have like a lethal mid range score in clutch games, you know? Right. Yeah. And I see you know, not necessarily apples to apples with Scotty, but I see the potential for him to present such a unique threat in that way. And since it's not as though the Raptors lack gravity. It may not be traditional shooting gravity, but Pascal is going to occupy defensive attention pretty consistently. So if you yeah. just, there's plenty of actions you can run where Pascal's on one side of the floor and Scotty's on the other. The defense starts to shade towards whatever action, but either a two man game that Pascal's running with Pirtle or a, you know, a, a ghost screen with shooters in Pascal and it just takes one good cross court pass to get uh, Scotty or like a back screen or something for Scotty to get an advantageous look. And I feel like they can manufacture that pretty consistently. That's what I would really like to see. What do you, what do you think though? I'm, I'm uh, no, I, I, no, 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 I agree. And I, I would say like you could go vice versa on that because I think Scotty can be the guy initiating that to find a cutting Pascal, something yeah. that's sort of underrated in Pascal is like, he is also a great off ball mover. I mean, 2019 NBA champion Pascal was he was getting most of his bread off Kawhi is double teamed hey I'm cutting to the basket that's a wide open layup for me um and I think ultimately he can sort he actually just had a quote today it's like hey I've played every role and every position in the NBA I remember only scoring off of leak outs and fast breaks when Kyle Lowry was on the court and I was a rookie and I slowly had to adjust to being in the corner and then being able to create for myself, et cetera, et cetera. Now you have a guy who can sort of wear multiple hats for you. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, Scotty has had to do that for the first two years of his career. You talked about his rookie year and just him being able to do that for a playoff team. I think one of the most impressive parts about him as a rookie was his ability to wear multiple hats um mm -hmm. and just function in different areas of the game and i know we haven't talked about the defensive side of the ball mm -hmm. but um i think that's also as you were talking just sort of something that i think it, he can tangibly improve in this season you can see it from obviously his physique what he can do physicality wise just something very i wouldn't say easy for him to be able to improve on but just the fact that that's something that's in his wheelhouse, something that he should absolutely be able to thrive in mm -hmm. um, and hasn't been able to, in my opinion, over the first two seasons of his career. And I think it's just like, that's easy money for him. You know and, what I mean? You know, that's another thing about Scotty's narrative that I think is so like interesting, like sort of uh, unsurprising, but still notable is that Scotty sort of like the Raptors, at writ large since their championship in 2019 or in 2019 when Scotty as a rookie plays such an important role for a really good team. And let's, I'm sure you don't forget listeners. Let's not forget in that series against the Sixers, you know, Joel Embiid hits a buzzer beater in game three, the Raptors take the next two games of that series. If that shot doesn't go in, you know, the Raptors know something about pivotal shots against the Sixers. <laughs> but if that shot does not go in, yeah. who knows what happens? Like Scotty Barnes was giving James Harden trouble defensively in that series. And yeah. it was always silly to say that Scotty Barnes, you know, guards one through five and is, you know, one of the most defensively malleable players in the game as a rookie, because that's just not true. Rookies, they don't make rookies who are that good at defense. It doesn't happen. Right. 
Right. And so since there was a step back last year for whatever reason, now there's this perception that he's like a bad defender or a minus defender. Maybe the numbers bore that out last year, but tools are tools and yeah. players get better at defense the longer the pl they play in the NBA and as they approach their athletic prime. That's just how it always goes. Yeah. And so, just more more film, right? Like they just yeah. they're they're exposed it, to more film. That's just purely you see more stuff. Like that helps in not only basketball, like everyday life, your job, right? Yep. Uh you're exposed to it more, more experience. You just get more used to things. And you know, and it's not as though he was thrust into a very uh easy to understand defensive scheme. You know, Nick's right. Coach yeah. Nurse's scheme asks a lot of a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what Darko is planning on that side of the ball. But if you just if we can just safely assume that they made a very good hire and they made a hire with intention and with Scotty in mind, if you keep Scotty from overextending on blitzes or whatever, and you try to yeah. keep him from being switched up against too many like lightning bug guards that can cross his hips up he can still be a very effective defender again you come back i come back to these dimensions and how rare an athlete yeah. scotty really is there are very few players very few even among the nba where every team has at least one max player most teams have two there are very few players capable of physically dictating a game's tempo and i know that's sort of an intangible quality but physically mm -hmm. dictating the game's tempo for like large stretches where yeah. defensive possessions unfold because how a, a player is guarding who he's guarding, the other team has to account for where he is on the floor. And the same on offense where now a defensive team needs to constantly account for a threat that a, that a given player possesses. Yeah. I think that Scotty still has a chance at being one of those players. And that is, is extremely valuable. And I just think that Scotty's reached a point where the focus is on his faults. The focus is on where he took a step back and that's fine. That's fair. That's how lots of players improve is by focusing on that stuff. But we just have to remember that like Scotty could come in and even not play up to his total potential and throw up like, 22 9 and 6 like yeah he, like like yeah. that's on on the table for him he can do that he's yeah. that good and so i it it is interesting trying to talk out how it might happen but that's how to me someone like scotty even someone who won rookie of the year gets to sort of a most improved player or gets to an all-star berth because the raptors again i think player half court offense sure there's focus on, you know, the downgrade from Van Vliet to Schroeder offensively, sure. Right. Um, but they still have an all-NBA level guy in Siakam. They still have OG, who's a very unique two-way weapon. Hurdle's an excellent defensive player and a very good DHO player on offense. And they've got Scotty, you know. So I they are one of the more confusing teams to me. That's why I wanted to have this, this discussion. Yeah. But I do think there is a legitimate path for this season to turn out like much better than what you're selling me on this team, man. I don't know. I like, <laughs> so I, I call color me skeptical. I, I sure. was, sure. yeah, I, I was a little, I'm probably on the skeptical side of things when it comes to the Raptors this season, maybe I'm reading too much into the roster construction thing and just not having enough shooting spacing especially for guys like Scotty and Pascal. But I, yeah, I don't know. You're kind of selling me on, hey, maybe this team is just too talented to not be good, you know? Well, like, yeah, and I, I'm not convinced. I'm not saying I'm coming here right. saying right. I have this little piece of information and like surprise <laughs> as they're actually awesome. Because right. like the, and if Scotty is shifting to a higher usage role, that comes with its own hiccups. Absolutely. Yeah. Teams are going to go under on them. That is a problem that is not going to get solved in and of itself this year. Like, so I, I'm with you that it's going to be hard. I think it's going to be tough for that Raptors team to be a top 20 offense. I yeah. get it. And it may just be that like 
the internal timelines, you know, Pascal's timeline and his priorities versus the team's timeline with Scotty, that it never, Scotty's never at his best while Pascal is still in his prime. Maybe mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. I right. get all that. I just like the talent is really there. And though I think Masai is almost becoming a parody of himself for what he asks for in these trade negotiations and what he has asked for, like valuing these guys highly does make some sense that that, that's all. That's all I'm saying. You know, that that's more how I feel. I, yeah, I hear you. I hear you on the value part. Um, And I think to your point about the hiccups with Scotty, that's sort of what is making me a little bit more skeptical that this team, like they won 41 games last year. Right. Yeah. And taking away Fred Van Vliet, adding in a rookie head coach who probably has to go through his own hiccups as well. Um, And then on top of that, giving this much usage to a 22 year old who might not be a point guard, but you're going to be playing him like a point guard this season, how that works throughout the course of an 82 game season makes me a little wary to be like this team is going to win more than 40 games next yeah, year. Yeah, sure. But but yeah, I, I I agree with the general point that like yeah, the talent on this team is there. It just depends on hey, how much do they capitalize on it? Do they coalesce all at once and if they end up moving any of these guys at any point in time, but and yeah, I agree and, generally. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, it's certainly no secret that I think like there might've been some exasperation in both directions between Nick nurse and some players on the team. So maybe the, sometimes a rookie head coach, the, the bounces in the other direction and right. that's, you know, it makes them harder to scout and maybe he has some really good ideas. I don't know Darko's background. I, I, I have no way to predict which way that will fall, right. but you never know. And maybe it is that they, you know, 40 is more appropriate, but I think there was, I think there were over unders at like 35, 36 right yeah, now. 36, so 36 and a half. Yeah. There you go. So I, I just think that it's, that is a tad disrespectful, a tad. I agree um, with that. Yeah. But where in the, like among their competitors in the East for maybe not top six, but sort of play in right. area. Um, how do you stack them up against uh, Atlanta, uh, Chicago? Uh, I, you know, maybe Orlando if you're an Orlando person. Maybe yeah. Charlotte if you believe in Lamelo coming back, making them formidable. Who, who do you sort of group them with? Okay, so let's just let's go through this together, right? Um, clearly, Boston, Milwaukee, no chance, right? No, th- different tier completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say the same for Cleveland. I would say the same for Philadelphia. I would say the same for New York. Um, I know Philadelphia is getting wary. It, the, we'll, we'll see, though. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Embiid's it, very good. Very right, good basketball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. MVP basketball player. <laughs> um, and then, you know, who else am I even forgetting about? Miami, obviously. Mm-hmm. Another mm-hmm. team. Tons of talent. I think they're going to be better than some people are saying with what, what's happening right now. Okay. The other side of this is Indiana. I would say has markedly improved this summer. I think they have done some good things. Tyrese Halliburton looks like a star. Yep. I think they they are going to be better than the Toronto Raptors. Um, you do. Ooh, okay. All right. Yeah. So I I think Indiana will actually be better. I, I who knows who knows what will happen. But I right now I think Indiana is going to be better than them. Um, Chicago I also think is going to have a bounce back season. Mm-hmm. I think Zach Levine was sort of. Uh, I guess working through some of the kinks of that injury through the first half of last year, he kind of got back to what he was in the second half. I think they found themselves a little bit of a defensive identity in that second half as well. They're adding to that defensive identity with guys like Torrey Craig and Javon Carter. I mm-hmm. like those additions. They've add some depth. Maybe Patrick Williams takes a step, et cetera, et cetera. I uh, think Chicago's due for Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully my, my guy, uh, my guy, I know, man, another guy. I'm very, very interested in <laughs> watch the season. Um, but yeah, I I'm higher on Chicago in general. And I think Atlanta just by the virtue of some of their young guys stepping into these roles, John Collins is out. So Jalen Johnson is playing more minutes, you know, mm-hmm. and Yeka Kongu is probably playing more minutes for them. AJ Griffin is probably playing more minutes for them. And with Quinn Snyder into the fold, I also think they're better. I don't think they're that much better, but I would say they're also better. Um, yeah. So to me, it's like, 
Toronto, Orlando, Brooklyn, how are we stacking up with those guys? Mm -hmm. I think I'd probably say Toronto is better than Orlando just by the virtue of them being a little bit more experienced than them, Mm -hmm. probably knowing how to close out a few different games versus Orlando having to go through the the bumps of being some young budding team, right? Um, They have their own spacing issues. Yeah, in Orlando. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Brooklyn is kind of interesting too. I'm I'm kind of curious to see how that all works and how that looks through an extended period of like 82 games. I'm not really sure if they're better or worse than the Raptors, but I would put them in a similar range. Uh, and then yeah, with Charlotte, I'm not sure either. It's just they're they're always kind of like, hey, Lamelo is interesting and Lamelo is fun, but can anybody else stay healthy enough for this team to actually do any damage? Um, and then our conversation about the most improved with Cade Cunningham, it's like, Hey, he's coming back. How That's right. can they be right with, with this guy back in the fold? I think the only team for sure that I'm guaranteeing that they're better than is Washington. And then th- that makes me sound really skeptical and, and just really low on this Raptors team. But ultimately there's just so much talent in the East. And if things shake one way or the other, you might be looking at like, a 12 seed versus them being a nine seed or a 10 seed or an eight seed in the Eastern conference. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going to push back on a couple of those teams. I so agree far. with you yeah. on some, but uh, first of all, uh, Brooklyn. I love Mikhail. I love him. I love that he averaged okay. 26 a game after, yeah. you know, the all-star break. I don't know how that team, like, is that team a top 15 offense? I, I kind of doubt it. Yeah, Are they a top 15 so. defense? I kind of doubt it. So like, Ooh, really? I think yeah. they could be a good D. Really? Well, when you think, when I think about, so Spencer Dinwiddie starting a point for them. Yeah, that's is that tough. The, is the idea. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, whatever, they still won't start Cam Thomas, which is what I would do. I just would, I want to just Lean see, just let him, if he's going to go down, let him go down swinging and prove that he's not worth those minutes. Cause all I ever see right. from cam is when he plays 35 minutes, he scores 35 points. And yeah, I yeah. love yeah. that about him. But um, I think that nowadays you either need to have um, really good sort of point of attack guards. And then uh, like everyone else knowing where to be behind them so that you're constantly sort of mucking up traditional actions. That's that's how Chicago yeah. keeps ending up in the top 12, despite seemingly having, you know, bad personnel because Vooch is their center and they have Levine and DeRozan, right. you know, that if you have point of attack hounds like Caruso and now Javon Carter reason I'm, I'm high on the bulls, you can manufacture a very good defense. Right. Um, I love Claxton as a defensive piece. I think he's like extremely talented but if they don't have like cam johnson is their starting power forward and i like cam i think that he i'm glad he got paid but if you're not threatening anyone from the weak side and your five man is uh you know nick's great but he's 215 pounds 220 not like the best rebounder in the world I think there's just little battles that you lose over the course of a game where you're, you're not deterring as many layups as you think you are. I, Caitlin Cooper, the great Caitlin Cooper um, gave the analogy recently about blocks being like a mousetrap. Like if a mousetrap works, it's great. You would, you'd rather just not need to have the mousetrap. You'd rather just, (laughs) you'd rather just deter the shots at the rim. So they never happen in the first place, as opposed to miles Turner having to chase everything down and erase all these mistakes. So I think Brooklyn's going to have a problem with that. And I think that Toronto will have every opportunity to be a better team than Brooklyn. Um, Speaking of the Pacers, I think the Pacers, I I think that they will have every opportunity to sort of make this mini leap that people want them to make, but they have a, what do we do when our best players off the floor problem? And in the regular season, we saw that last year too. Yeah. I mean, that matters. If you think that Tyrese Halliburton is going to play 82 games in 36 minutes a night, then yeah, like Indians going to be pretty good, but (laughs) that stuff, you know, it's easier said than done. And when you couple that with 
their defensive personnel. I love Bruce Brown, thought that was a great use of funds for them to get him, but they're still bringing along multiple young pieces in Jarris and in Matherin. Yeah. You know, those are guys that are probably going to play pretty substantial minutes. Halliburton still needs a lot of defensive accommodation. Like it's asking a whole lot of miles again. If miles misses any time, what happens to the defense? Like, right. I, I think that there are ways for that to go wrong. So more ways for that to go wrong than it were to go wrong with the Raptors would be my question there. Um, You can, I'll call it a coin flip between the two teams and I'll leave okay. it at that. I, I would okay. not definitively say that I should expect the Pacers to be better. Um, okay. Fair. Now the Hawks, I think the Hawks will be better. I think the, uh, they know how to play on offense and they have a very high baseline of offensive execution. And even if Trey misses time, DeJounte, I, yeah. I, I think they did pretty well with Trey off the floor with yeah. DeJounte on the floor, which I think was a first for that team in sort of the Trey era. They're also very deep. They just, they can withstand sort of the regular season grind. I think Quinn will do a, a, a decent job organizing all of that. So I think they have a baseline above Toronto. Um, but when you look at the rest, you know, all the teams you mentioned is a clear tier above Miami. I'll just pause because they weren't a great regular season team last year. And I they think they tend to sleepwalk through the regular season too. And whatever. their guys miss time. You know, yep. Jimmy's getting older, you know, it, it can be hard. And I think the assumption Spo's a great coach, but just being like, well, and we all know Spo will take some undrafted guy and then he'll just be <laughs> a really good rotation. Like, or maybe it won't, <laughs> like, yeah, or yeah, maybe yeah. they won't find that guy. So like, I, I think that the Dame pursuit has taken its toll in terms of opportunity cost for them. That's so yeah. I, I think that while I wouldn't pick the Raptors to be better than them necessarily, I don't think that they are sort of head and shoulders above all these other teams nipping at their heels. Right. Um, but Chicago and like I'm lower on Orlando than most because of the, of the spacing issue. And I like, if they're going to play Anthony black a lot as a six overall pick as a rookie, I think there's going to be lots of hiccups there. Yep. Um, Charlotte, I think could be good, but I, like, I've avoided talking about Charlotte because of Miles Bridges. I don't really want to yeah, say too much about him, but that was the hardest preview to do because I was like, I don't know how to be right. Yeah, yeah, and I think at at the very least, um, even if you don't want to cover just sort of the ickiness of it, yeah, w what is that like? How much usage is he expected to have? Because he, he was a high like? usage yeah. guy. He was a near All Star before yeah. he got suspended. So like. Is he expecting the same level? Or is, is he, he expect... even going to be at the same level? You know what right. I mean? Right. Like, he was a great yeah. defensive player too. How does a year off affect that? Like, yeah. there are real questions there. So the team that I think out of all of these, all this cluster that I'm notably higher on, I think than everyone else is Chicago. I think they got to stay healthy. They were very healthy last year. Vooch yeah. and Pat Williams played all 82 yeah. You know, Levine played 77 or something like that, something preposterous. Yep. So if they lose on health, then they lose on health. But they've now been together for a few years. It's safe to assume that with Javon uh, in tow that they're and Caruso as defensive guards in that rotation, their defense is going to be good again. Mm -hmm. And I think Kobe White took a step forward. I will always believe in the Pat Williams breakout until he's 47 years old. I, I think so, it's coming this year, man. Maybe not most improved breakout like we right, were talking, right, right. but yeah, I think I think he'll take a leap. I think but I just leap. there's something to be said in the NBA where there's so much roster churn and turnover for teams that just sort of get used to playing with one another and just sort of mm -hmm. figure that out. And now their stars have been together for two plus years. There's a defensive infrastructure in place. There's an offensive infrastructure in place. Right. And as long as DeMar doesn't like fall off a cliff athletically, as long as he still has another year where he's really good, I could see that team winning like 45 or more. Like I, I think they're good. So 
where that leaves Toronto, you know, probably in that eight to 11 range. But I, I think there are a lot of questions in the Eastern conference and that sort of glut. That's how I feel. Yeah, I agree. I, I wonder, you didn't mention Detroit because I think they still have some ways to go. Um, they do. Yeah. And there's, there's going to be a lot of growing pains there, but I I'm kind of curious to see how that all kind of looks with Cade and mm-hmm. Ivy, then Durant, Durant and throwing him into the mix. And like, yeah, just interesting team. Another and, like weird Eastern Conference team that might be trying to take a leap, but also probably isn't going to take the leap everybody expects. Well, and I actually think that Detroit, I think they're interesting. Like I, I could have mentioned them. And I think a very key player for them, low key is Marcus Sasser, their rookie 25th oh, yeah. overall pick. Because you got to, again, backup point guard, you can really, really win minutes and flip games in the regular right. season if you have a bench unit with a very good backup point. And as we've seen recently, like young players, you know, Nemhard did this for stretches before he was asked to be a starter in Indiana last year, but uh, Jose Alvarado uh, in New Orleans, uh, even Emmanuel quickly, you know, throughout his time in New York, you can get young guys and Sasser's 22 years old because, you know, he's played Multi-year in college guy. forever, but yeah. That can make a big difference. The real difference between that and like a 19 year old Killian Hayes running your backup point. So (laughs) I, and whatever, I actually like Killian more than most two, but I think that Detroit will be better. I just don't know how they figure out all those bigs and how that shakes out. So yeah, interesting. But as far as most improved goes, you know, you've done this leap series where I think you covered Devin Vassell, you've covered Jalen Suggs. Yep. Uh, I've covered my guy, Mr. 50, 40, 90 himself, TM3. Yes, sir. Uh, Jonathan Kaminga, I think you hit on. Yep. Um, you clearly are interested in in breakouts. Okay, Absolutely. So, Love that aspect of the NBA game. It's like my favorite thing to try to do. But it's also a difficult task. We were kind of talking about this before, but like it's it, it's tough to predict a breakout because I've done this before. I sort of jump the gun a little bit. I, I'm always a year too year early, early. Yeah. <laughs> on, on something. And it always gets me, I'm like, damn it, you know? Yeah. But yeah. The, the dart chuckers lament. No, I'm there with you, man. <laughs> but uh, okay, so if we go back to like sort of what we're talking about, either a first-time All-Star or okay. a player who's going to be an All-Star many times over down the line. Right. Um, we can look to the 2021 draft, third-year players. Scotty is one of them. Right. Cade's one of them. Mobley, believe it or not, has not made an all-star team yet. Uh, right. Franz Wagner, Josh Giddy, if that's your flavor. Is there any out of those names? Literally un- any of them. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> Do any stick out to you? Any uh, like in particular? Because usually, mm-hmm. again, it's a narrative award. So usually the team takes like a big jump and wins. And that right. can... so. Where do you see out of that a narrative potentially emerging for any of those talents? I like all those guys too. And we should mention yeah. Jalen Green and Alper and Shin Gun in Houston. Right. Yeah. Uh Green is a pretty nice pick. Uh I don't think that's the guy I would pick first. I would probably say Evan Mobley is the guy to look for in that draft because the Cavs seem like they're ready to take a leap. I like the Max Struess edition. I like the George Niang edition. They could be that you know, like we've seen it in the Eastern Conference before, the team that just destroys everybody in the regular season, but probably still has some playoff questions remaining. Like that that kind of fits the build of what Cleveland could be this season. Mm-hmm. And maybe Mobley is the catalyst to that, right? Um, whether it's like the defensive impact or he's improved as an offensive player, score, shooter, whatever you want to say, post-up player, just face-up guy. I, I'm not sure exactly where that leap would be. Um but I think Mobley seems like a pretty good pick. I mean, he was already third in defensive player of the year voting last year. Like there is tangible evidence to say that he, if we're going based on narrative, gets love um, a lot. So maybe Mobley's the guy who I would pick from that draft class. But I could, I really could see any of those guys being the guy who kind of breaks out and becomes an all-star this year. Yeah, I am with you. I okay. would also, if I'm picking out of that cluster, First of all, I have no doubt that Evan Mobley is like going to be an all-star for Absolutely. a long time. Yeah. That That's a formality to me. So if 
you believe that, then you might as well just say, well, now it can happen this year. That makes him first time all-star The team could be a one seed for all we know, maybe closer to a two or a three, but like really good. Yeah. And so that everything will line up for him. Um, I want to give a mention to Shen Gun though. And I okay. did my Rockets episode um uh, this week with Salman Ali. Uh you know, Fred in town now. There's no doubt in my mind that team is going to be clearly better than what it's been. Absolutely. Co- yeah. Coaching upgrade, roster upgrade, you know. And I think that Shen Gun's offensive creativity is going to survive because the team still needs it. I think like they need him to have a good amount of usage. And I believe in his skill set offensively, like a lot. So that's yeah. not saying he's going to be an all-star, but if they are hovering around 500 or at least in the play-in race for a lot of the season, and he's putting up, you know, 16 and 10 or whatever, then I think he would get in that discussion a lot. Or Jalen, you know, maybe, maybe Jalen takes this leap. I just think that Jalen has further to go to be a really good player at his position than Shen Gun does at right. his. So that's yeah. sort of my thought there. Um, so I would say that the betting favorite, I believe the betting favorite right now is Austin Reeves. Another 2021 non-draftee, but another right. from that class in LA. Um, I can see lots of people wanting to fall all over themselves to, to make him the most improved player. Right. And I like Austin's game a lot. What do you think of that? Like team's going to be good. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think he gets enough like usage on that team to hit that mark? Yeah. That's tough for me to see um, because there's a world where he does look much better. His shot has looked much improved over the last calendar year. I would mm-hmm. say um, if the shooting is there and like post all-star break, he averaged near 18 he was like an 18, five and five type guy, yep. uh, good efficiency and like 18, five and five from 12, five and four, whatever it was beforehand. That's a pretty sizable leap. If he can do that for a consistent amount this season on a 50 plus win team for the Lakers, I, I could see it. I could see it. Also, there's the question of how many games LeBron and AD are going to play and what's the right. usage lebron is going to have this year and if if lebron is playing more of a off-ball role and they are initiating a lot of their actions through austin reeves through the pick and roll stuff with him in ad then maybe there's a world where that does happen um although i i kind of feel like the leap that people are expecting like what we saw it, it's sort of we we already saw it last year it's just about seeing it for a full season now i think yeah yeah, I think that's true, but that sometimes doesn't matter for the award. You no, know, you're right. for the yeah. for the award, it's about well, what is your average this season? I mean, you could say the same thing about Mobley because the defensive leap he took the second half of last year was incredible, you know, yeah. and put him on those end of year ballots. Um, another player that came to my mind about this, uh, and the team would need to be good, but I think they are gonna be good, is Jada McDaniels in Minnesota. So not that I think that Jaden is like a future multi-time all-star. I don't know if he necessarily passes that test, but I think he's going to be an all defense player. If not this year, then sometime soon. And if that team is now like a top three seed in the West for, you know, maybe there's injuries, whatever, and they really exceed where they can go. I think there's a chance for him to get some love in that department. What do you think about, them in his case kind of need the shooting and scoring to be up a little bit because i think one of the other sides of this narrative is like it is a little bit points per game based uh narrative yeah, wise sure. people people look at that a little bit maybe too much if you, if you want to talk about it but i think you'd need a pretty sizable leap in scoring i don't know what his average was last year probably about 12. around 12 right about 12, yeah. yeah um so if it, if it was 12, like, can he get to eight, 17, 18? And is that enough to edge out a Mobley or, you know, whoever else that we've kind of mentioned in this conversation? 
I don't know, but I, I like the pick because I think it makes a lot of sense. I'll throw out another name at you, okay? Mm-hmm. How do you think about Quentin Grimes? This is a little mm. bit of a off the radar pick here. <laughs> kind of curious to see what you think about him in general, but also uh, a guy who is an elite shooter, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Potentially can get more opportunities here to get some open shots. There was talk today about him potentially expanding his game, getting more on ball reps. Maybe Quentin Grimes gets yep. the lead here. Yeah. Uh, love Quentin. I recently uh, guested on uh, the Strickland, the Knicks oh, nice. podcast, and talked about Quentin. <laughs> I was talking about their like talking about my piece where I ranked all these players, but like Quentin was the only like Nick in the top fifty, and I talked about Quentin Grimes for, like forty five <laughs> minutes. Love, love, <laughs> love Schwinn. Love the Strickland guys. You know they're irreplaceable. But I think. The issue there is consistency usage. in minutes and usage because they, yeah. you know, I talked about it on that on that podcast. But like, if I were Quentin Grimes, I I don't know if I'd be angry, but I'd mm-hmm. be like, you just okay. So Josh Hart <laughs> gets eighteen a year. Okay, I love Josh. You just signed Divincenzo. Like, yeah. Yeah. should I have gone to Villanova? Like, would my spot be more secure if I had? <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 that's the only question. Bronson's going to shoot a lot. RJ and Randall are going to get their shots up. How like how does he get the shots to do it? I I love Quentin's talent, but that's that's more my question with him. Right. Yeah. I'll throw another New York Borough uh, team at you. We talked about him a little bit. Maybe he doesn't average what he did with the 50, 40, 90 on 26 points a game but bridges like bridges is another guy that kind of did a leap last year kind of like austin reeves right so yeah i think possible if brooklyn's good like if brooklyn's good mikhail will make the all-star team because he'll be by far their best player and his stats will be like wonderful i think that he and reeves are two of the top like odds players i don't think that brooklyn's gonna be that good and also Mikhail, like, not only did he average 26 after going there last year, but he also, like, he's played in the finals as a starter already. So it's not that it can't be him, but the players who've won this award recently, you know, Lari, you know, Ja won it when Memphis took, like, a big leap up the standings. Pascal, you know, Giannis won it when he really leaped. Um, Oladipo when he changed teams like right. if you are I think Mikhail's a very good player but not like a superstar if you're a non-superstar your team has to like be a big surprise right and I just I'll say it's possible I'm skeptical but well, it's like it, it's a second. logical pick that's what yeah. I would say fair yeah. enough fair enough and then like you get into the uh you know we had the discussion about Kate Cunningham earlier yeah is uh Jordan Poole going to get, I mean, Jordan Poole's going to get insane amounts of usage. The Wizards will not be good, but he's mm-hmm. just going to get so much usage that like, hey, does he just, just because of points per game, does he end up averaging 28 a night? You know what I mean? Like something yeah, crazy yeah. like that, that gets him in the conversation. Just looking at teams just to see if there's anybody else that kind of. If Trey didn't out. tear his meniscus, I'd be talking about Trey, mm-hmm. obviously, mm-hmm. but he did yeah. and that sucks. Um, Poole, I thought about too. I, you know, I'm going to be excited to watch the Wizards, but that's my sort of diseased brain. I'm like, ooh, the Wizards <laughs> are really interesting now because I want to see, I want to see how Bilal looks as well because I like yeah. Bilal a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, So I like pool. Yeah, I, I think now, even though there's still such a premium on uh, points for these awards, I think the combo guard thing is starting to peter out a little bit where so, like, so we're starting to get a little smarter on the, yeah, I get what you're saying. I get what yeah. You're saying. So I think like pool hero, I think by the way, Tyrese Maxi is a pretty good can If we assume Harden's not going to be there, right. Maxi, good team, very talented scorer. They could win 50 games and he could get this love. The issue with Maxi is that he's already averaged 20 a game the last two years. So he's going to have to go to like 25, 26, 27 to, yeah. to, to do it. Not mm-hmm. impossible, but that's the only question with him. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think 
like empty calories. I think the the, the voters kind of know what that is now. And I think Jordan, even if it's unfair, will get labeled as an empty calorie guy if that team's terrible. And they're probably yeah. not going to be very good. So no, yeah, you're right. You're right. I think yeah. I think there is a bit of a label there with those types of guys. I can't really see anybody else being thrown into the conversation, but this is the greatest part about this because I didn't see Lowry Markinen being put into the conversation last year and it's just yeah you know yeah i know i i try to think if there was another jazz player that was possible it'd be nice it'd be a nice story if like starting point guard jordan clarkson did it right. i also think that the jazz are going to be better than like i i don't think they're going to win 32 games i think they can win 36 37 and be in that playing yeah. discussion so yeah i agree they can have the narrative to do it but out of all the names we've said, you know, we think Mobley's got a good shot. I think Reeves and Bridges probably have good shots. Um, would you and you would you give Cade Franz your own Scotty? Do you think any of them have a real good chance, or do you think you win a push class, comes to shove? No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I would maybe go Jalen if I'm going another player in that draft class. Okay. Um just because he is a 20 point per game guy and he has been but also he hasn't been the most efficient player and right. if he can somehow find a way to be uber efficient this season just because of the talent level that has increased around him maybe maybe potentially yeah. right there's there's a world there he goes from like 20 points a game to like you said 25 for maxi um if that's the world and he's maybe shooting something a little bit more efficiently than 40% from the field, um, <laughs> then, then yeah, I could see Jalen green being put into that conversation. I like the maxi pick too, though. Yeah. Okay. And if, if you take Jalen, I'll take Shen gun. Cause I, okay. I just believe in him. So Jalen Shen gun, maxi, uh, Mobley, and then Reeves and Mikhail. So we narrowed it down to like eight players. Look at us, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> what a good job we did. But thanks, very nice. Very, thank you very so nice. much, Jess. Um, I've taken too much of your time, but any other, anything else on your mind that is in the realm of what we talked about that you want to hit before I let you go? Uh, I, I would mostly, I, I think like developmentally, uh, and we've sort of touched on this throughout this podcast. We've touched on it through our conversations on Twitter and whatnot, but um. It's just always interesting to me to see how these guys work through the kinks of their game, what sort of things impact that, whether it be roster construction, whether it be team building, whether it be their own emphasis on, you know, working out whatever they do in the summer to get prep for a season. There's just so many factors, and I'm personally so fascinated with that aspect of basketball. It's like to tangibly improve or not improve or maybe marginally improve um and then seeing that progression the coolest part of basketball uh by far so i just it's a good conversation to have with someone who i think is in a similar boat of of loving these guys and seeing how they're going to end up developing but yeah of course yeah that's everything man basketball is yeah. about improvement that's yeah any Hall of Famer, whoever gives an interview talks about how, you know, every summer they get better, they get better, they get better, they get better. Right. So, all right, man. Thank you so much, S. Thank uh, thank you for all you do, your work with SDPN, the Objective Basketball Podcast. Anything in particular you want us to, like, check out in the next week or so of yours? Uh, I would just say the, the podcast is coming back up uh, in about a week. So, you know. Go and check it out, the Objective Basketball Podcast. And obviously, Chuck, appreciate you. Love you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for listening. This has been Chucking Darts. It's okay to be wrong about sports. Find your dartboard and start chucking. Thank you.